Hi, my name is Vicki and I have Sjogren's disease and this video is how I got diagnosed and what labs and tests were done. So I was referred to a rheumatologist by a primary care provider. My labs at the military clinic showed that I had inflammation, um, like the kind you would have with RA, but I didn't show signs and symptoms that are traditionally associated with RA. So that's why he referred me to rheumatology. Once I saw the rheumatologist, um, that first visit, he did a physical exam, he examined my head, asked me about headaches, looked in my eyes, my mouth, um, checked all of my lymph nodes, asked me about dental history, he checked my joints, my fingers, looked at my feet, um, my skin, he had me walk across the room and then just stand still. He found that I definitely had some hypermobility. Um, my hands can do this. I used to be able to do it back a whole lot farther. I could bring my thumb down this way to my arm. And then my legs, my, my knees would bow out like the the calves would bow out when my knees were straight and locked. Um, but he kind of dismissed those things because I had taken ballet for four years and dance till probably 19 years old. Um, and so I had a pretty significant turnout um, of my feet to point like to the sides. Um, but I had been, I had practiced that um, for so long. And so he kind of just dismissed it as, um, forming or shaping or training. Um, he didn't really associate it with anything else, at least not at that time. He did not find very dry skin, but I did have evidence of hair loss on my shins and not the kind from shaving your legs, just hair loss. He asked me about my dental history, um, if I had had cavities a lot chronically, um, despite taking good care of my mouth. He also asked me about trauma history. Um, and I had been hit by a car at uh, 15 and significantly damaged my left femur, which is that long bone between your hip and your knee. Um, I smashed it up pretty good and was in traction for mm, two and a half months. I think it was 10 weeks and then in a body cast for another 10 and a half weeks. I was very slow healing. Um, in fact, the doctor at that time said that I was healing backwards, whatever that means. <laughs> um, but there definitely was some significant trauma um, emotionally, mentally, as well as the physical. So at that time, he did some lab work. Um, so he did a lot of different labs. And he also referred me to a oral surgeon for a lip biopsy. And I just went to the oral surgeon that they set me up with. And he did a lip biopsy. And they did a little incision right here. Um, I was numb, so I didn't feel it. And afterwards, I think I had just two stitches, maybe three. And the first three days, I my lip was a little swollen. And um, I could eat after whatever I wanted after the first three days. But it was hard, you know, to move and eat with. So mostly I ate jello soups and drank liquids. Eventually I just had to switch to a straw for this other side. And after day three, I don't remember having um, trouble with it. I, I ate more soft foods by then, like mashed potatoes, um, that kind of stuff. And then I think at six, uh, and then I think at two weeks, I had to go back in and get the stitches removed. 
And after like four or five days, I could eat whatever I wanted. I don't remember having pain in it at all. I just remember the stitches being annoying. Um, and after that, you know, I was fine. I don't remember it being significantly horrible. Um, things may have been done differently back then because that was 1999 um, when I was actually diagnosed. And this is, well, 2024. Um, I think maybe they take biopsies from both sides or maybe different areas. I've heard that too. Um, but they didn't do that for me. And I, I remember being uncomfortable and it being painful the first couple days, the first 48 hours. Um, but I was given hydrocodone for that. Not codeine, but hydrocodone plus Tylenol. I might be called Lortab. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, then after, gee, I think it was, oh, they also put me on prednisone. Um, that day, I think it was like a taper starting at 20 milligrams. Now they start at 30, but back then I was given 20 milligrams and just to taper it down like every two days. So then I came back in two weeks and oh my gosh, I felt better. I think surely it was the prednisone that helped. Um, but, um, they gave me the, um, results of my lip biopsy. They didn't really discuss my labs with me, but I asked for a printout and that's how I saw them. Uh, my lip biopsy did come back positive. And at that time he said, you definitely have Sjogren's. Um, he gave me a pamphlet uh, with information and different resources on it. Um, but he really didn't say much about what Sjogren's is. And I had no idea. I'd never heard of it before. And so um, then he also put me on Plaquenil that day. I think it was 20 milligrams twice a day, if I can recall. I had to t stop taking it in 2021, I think, because of an issue the eye doctor noticed with my eyes. But I did really well on Plaquenil. The only issue I had was some itching that at that time I really didn't notice very much. It kind of gradually increased over time and it would only be if I showered or scrubbed my legs at all. Um, so what really helped me with my itching was ice packs and not to scrub my legs or wash them with soap. Um, and if I had shaved my legs, that also made it feel better. Um, and I felt that it was really worth it to go through the itching because in all the other ways, the Plaquenil had helped me so much. I mean, I was able to get through school for nursing, work in nursing for till I think 2017, end of 2017, I had to stop working. So, um... That was the day I started Plaquenil, and um, he did a lot more labs again. And the labs that they had done in tests, not just the lip biopsy, but they did a CBC, um, which is a complete blood count. So they look at everything in your blood that's supposed to be there, and they also know stuff in there that shouldn't be. So from a CBC, they can tell if you have inflammation um, or if something um, is awry and for some reason your blood is fuller than it should be um, of particulate, like solid stuff, which would happen if you had a lot of inflammation. So they weigh it and the heavier it is, that points to um, inflammation or other things in there that shouldn't be. So then they also do a CBC. They do your red, your red blood cells, um, your platelets, how much hemoglobin is in your red blood cells, um, your white blood cells. And when they do CBC with differential, they count how many of each type of what red blood cells you have. And, um, 
They also compare it to your overall blood cell, white blood cells. So they know what percentage that type is compared to all the rest of them. So if you have a lot of neutrophils, um, a lot of macrophages, the ones that go around gobbling up stuff, you know, that might indicate um, a viral infection, or if you have like a lot of lymphocytes out being in action, that would be significant for maybe an autoimmune disease. And so the reason they test platelets is because if you don't have as much platelets, you would um, not be able to form clots as well. When, Like if you get a skin tear or you get a cut on your finger, um, the body automatically comes rushing in, um, you know, your white blood cells to clean it up. Your platelets morph into these clotting strands that create a scab and cut off, you know, the bleeding. So if you didn't have as much platelets, you might bleed more easily and take longer for the clotting to happen. They also did a complete metabolic panel and those show electrolytes, your blood sugar levels, um, how much, how much insulin you have, and so much more. So electrolytes are like the calcium, the sodium, the potassium, magnesium. So they also tested my liver function. They also did um, kidney function test and a urine sample. And so they look at the urine to see if anything is getting out into the urine that should not be leaking out from the kidneys. And that shows your filtration rate, um, how well the kidneys are functioning, how well they're filtering it. Because if things are getting out that aren't supposed to be, um, that's not good. It's my understanding, too, that show, with Sjogren's, there's more usually protein um, in the urine. And so proteins really aren't supposed to be leaking out like that. They did HIV and hep C test. And one of the most valuable tests that they do that um, has a lot of weight to it for diagnosing autoimmune disease is, is ANA titers. And they look at um, antibodies. So there's your SSA, which is also called Rho, and there's your SSB, which is also called LA, LA. What I've seen in the, as the latest count on the Sjogren's, um, foundation website is that 70% of people test positive for SSA and 40% test positive for SSB. I tested positive for both. My SSA, I think, was 7,000 something. I mean, it was really high up there. And my SSB was 300 something. But according to the Sjogren's Foundation, the amount of those titers and how high they are don't really reflect the severity of disease. In my eyes, especially at that time, I saw that 4,000 something and went, whoa, I'm really sick. I'm not really sure if my labs reflected how sick I was. But it's good to know that even with labs that high, you can still reach a state of remission. One test that's often done is the Schreimer's test, where um, they put that paper like under your eyelid here and it's kind of hangs out and they test to see how long it takes for it to get moist. They're testing your tear production, how fast or slow or reduced it is. One of those Schreimer's tests was not done on me, not at the rheumatologist or the eye doctor. They can also do this eye test called a Rose Bengal I don't know if I'm saying it properly. It's B-E-N-G-A-L, um, Rose Bengal. And it, it uses lysamine, which is a green test or green sort of dye. Um, and they use it, they put it in your eyes and they use it to examine the surface of your eye to see if there's been damage there as well. That test was not done for me. 
since diagnosis, all my labs have been normal. Um, well, up until uh, 20, gosh, I would say 2018. And I've been able to make dietary changes and um, exercise changes and that sort of thing to help with those abnormal labs. And there weren't very many of them. They weren't, you know, elevated or lowered enough to really be super concerned, but just enough that I knew that I needed to make some changes. And so that's how I was diagnosed and the different labs and tests that they did for me. So if you're interested in what is all the different things they test for in the different various labs like the CBC and all those, I will have a specific list of each of those labs, you know, what and why and what would be looked for in order to kind of point towards an autoimmune diagnosis. So I'm sorry if this video was kind of long. There's kind of a lot to diagnosing any autoimmune disease um, and Sjogren's. So I hope it wasn't too long. And if you are struggling right now with symptoms and you think it could possibly be an autoimmune disease, I hope that you will strongly advocate for yourself and keep advocating and keep knocking at that door. Keep researching and educating yourself um, because if with the education you gain, um, you'll be even more able to advocate for yourself. Um, and one thing, I just as a tip at the tail end, one thing that I learned to do not all that long ago either, is that when a provider, whether it's a general provider or rheumatology or something like that, when they um, refuse, like flat out refuse to give you a referral for something you know that you need, or they say, ah, let's give it two weeks and come back in two weeks and we'll see. I what I started doing was asking them, can you write that in my chart, please? Can you just do a quick note that I did ask um, without demanding, but just letting them know. I struggle with what words to say. So usually before I go to an appointment, I write down what my concerns are um, and I try to make those really short because the appointment, there's only so much time. And then I also write down for myself what I can say that is therapeutic and functional and appropriate to the provider that will communicate whether I feel that my need is being met and can, if they could please die, if they could please, um, enter into my chart that I did ask, but, um, was, you know, recommended not to be referred. That's a good way to say it. <laughs> um, I hope that you'll keep on trying and not give up. So give yourself some pats on the back and a gentle hug because it's going to be okay. Thanks for listening to my diagnosis story.